Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Anita White Carter. I'm a reference librarian here, and I want to welcome you all to our, our brown bag series. We're very fortunate to have a, a Jackie Langel. 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 Yes. I'm sorry, Jackie. Um, from uh, Environmental Studies to talk with us today. <laughs> and to give you more information about Jackie, we have uh, Dr. Reynolds, Hello. professor Hello. and chair of Environmental <laughs> Studies. Thank you, Anita. So, yeah, we're, we're very glad to have Jackie here today to talk to us. We're very happy in our department that we have Jackie as our newest uh, faculty member. She came to us just this past fall Mm -hmm. from the University of Tennessee where she's just finished up her doctoral work and the research that she's going to be talking to us today about, about what she's going to be talking to us today, uh, is the work she's done in the Himalayas and she's been there twice. 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 Mm -hmm. Jackie uh, originally grew up in Idaho, so if you want to know anything about potatoes, <laughs> check with her. She knows it all and she loves them. Yeah, and your okay. bachelor's work at University of Idaho. Idaho State. Yes. And then Washington, Central Washington. Yep. She's a master. So. so she moved to the southeast <laughs> some years ago, but still got to points farther afield. Mm -hmm. So we're very glad <coughs> to have Jackie. Well, thanks, Kitty. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you all for coming. I'm excited to talk to you about some of the work I've been doing, and I'll have a few minutes at the end to talk about some of the work I'm continuing to do, along with some students here at UNCA. So thanks for letting me talk to you about it. So um, like Kitty and Anita said, I have been doing some research in the Himalayas. Um, my field of research will probably be changing, but I want to talk to you about some of the stuff I've been doing. I did for my PhD, and um, some of it I'm going to continue to do here. So this is a picture of Leopargal Peak, which is part of a geologic feature called the, Ge the Leopargal Dome, which is what I focused my dissertation work on. It's in northwest India, in the Indian Himalayas. It's about a three to four day drive, depending on road conditions, from Delhi. So you fly into Delhi and then you drive north on some really interesting roads that I'll show you some pictures of. Um, and then I got a chance to go there twice and do some really amazing work there. It was beautiful and it was just really neat. So um, I'm going to share some of that with you today. So um, before I talk, I wanted to give you some um, idea of who I need to be thinking. Uh, I've had a, I was fortunate to have a lot of funding sources that helped me get there, which was a big deal. That was obviously not cheap. So I had support from the Geological Society of America, from ExxonMobil, from Sigma's Eye, um, all of these I'm members with. And I was thankful that they were able to give me some money to help support this. Also, um, I want to thank everybody in this picture. These are, this is the first field season group. So um, there's me, my advisor Micah Graham, and this is John Cottle and Liz. Graham and Liz were two of my field assistants in my first field season. Micah Jessup was my PhD advisor, and then John Cottle was, he's a professor at uh, University of California, Santa Barbara, who's part of my research team. I also need to acknowledge my husband, Paul, because he was actually my field assistant in my second field season. He, he was really good. So um, I need to acknowledge him. Also, I had a lot of support from the University of Delhi, and I've had a chance to have a lot of students be part of this project. Um, from the University of Tennessee, I had uh, three different undergrad students work on this project with me. And here I have two that are going to be continuing. One is Corey, who's here. Hi, Corey. Um, so I wanted just to acknowledge all of these sources. So before I tell you about um, what I've done, I need to give you some background on the geology. And so this, if you haven't seen what the, Him the Himalaya look like, this is what it looks like. So here's the Himalaya range. This is India. This is Tibet. And this whole area right here is considered the Tibetan Plateau. So physiographically, it's very distinct because, as you know, this is the highest mountain range on Earth. And so it obviously has a very complicated and interesting geologic history, which is what I'm going to be talking to you about. But um, essentially what's happened is through time, India has been moving northward to a point where it's actually collided with Eurasia. This is called Eurasia. These two tectonic plates collided and formed all of this, um, all of the high peaks that are basically being squeezed between those two tectonic plates. 
And so it's not really all that simple. And by the end of this talk, you'll get to find out why. Um, so first, some background on how India has actually ended up where it is now. This is a diagram that shows the restored location of India through geologic time. So at about 84 million years ago is the first um, documentation that we have where we really know where India was. It was right here. Tibet is up here. This would be where the Indian plate is currently. And so at about 84 MA, which just means million years ago, the Indian continent just started cruising on up towards Tibet really fast. You see how much space there is between each of these. That means it was just moving really, really fast. It was moving at about 20 centimeters per year, which is really, really, that's just incredible. Um, but what happened was when it finally came up and then it started to converge with Asia, it slowed down. Because what's happening is that while India was down here, there was a whole bunch of oceanic crust separating these two continental plates. Oceanic crust is relatively more dense, and so as this whole plate was moving northward, all of this oceanic crust was getting subducted underneath Tibet. And it, because it's so dense, it can just be subducted under there. So India was just able to keep on going. But once the continent collided, they're both similar densities, and so the subduction had to stop, essentially. And so what happened then was that all this crust just got smashed up into these really high peaks rather than being subducted. And so you can tell the fact that these are spaced closer together shows that the rate slowed down. And so based on these restorations, we know it was about 55 million years ago when this rate slowed down. So that's when we think the, India's, or the, the Himalayas first started forming. The youngest marine sediments we have are 54 million years ago. So we uh, infer that the Himalayas actually started forming soon after that. So about 50 MA million years ago, something like that. And that was, since then, we've still had India. India is still pushing north. It's just not being subducted anymore. So we still have a modern convergence rate of four centimeters per year, which is still really significant. So there's still a lot of crustal deformation happening. And that makes this a really great place geologically to explore. So this is what the crust is doing today. So India has collided with Asia. It's um, pushing northward. And all of these arrows, these are called vectors. And the longer the vector, it means the faster that crust is moving. So India is pushing up this way. And basically, you can see what that's doing is it's pushing all of this crust north. And so these are pretty long vectors, so it's moving pretty rapidly. That's about four centimeters per year. Um, well, sorry, well, that would be about uh, 40 millimeters per year. But what's interesting, though, is that there's this really weird dynamic where up here there's not much happening. And then here you can see these arrows are curving. And so that goes into something I'm going to be talking about today, and that's called extension. So this is a... An, an origin, origin just means mountain range, that's formed because you have these plates converging together. So you expect the thrust to be thick, the crust to be thickened. You expect to have thrust faults, which means you have rocks stacking up on top of each other. But here we have that, but we also have extension, which means the crust is pulling apart. And why exactly is still a um, big matter of debate. But you can see here what's happening. This, these are moving up and then moving that way. So basically right here, you're extending the crust. And so we'll talk about some more ideas about how that actually forms. Um, but that was the focus of my dissertation research, was to try and quantify how this extension actually happens. So this is an aerial view of the Himalayas, which I think is really nice to show you some of the geologic features that are very important. So here's the high Himalaya. Uh, Everest is right in here. And you can see here's the Indian plate. Then you have the high Himalaya. These formed by these two fault systems that span the entire mountain range. They're very significant. They are basically the reason these high mountains are here. And it's called the main central thrust in the South Tibetan detachment. And so when India first collided with Asia, these faults formed to help accommodate that crust, basically getting smashed together. Um, what's interesting about these, though, is that these faults are no longer active. They became inactive about 30 million years ago. So from about 50 to 30 million years, they were active. But we know India is still moving north into Asia. So 
how is that being accommodated? Well, it's being accommodated on the main frontal thrust. So this, um, this is a fault that basically took over for these two faults when they became inactive. This one is still currently moving, it's still active. So it's a huge problem really because this is a huge, I mean it's not hugely populated everywhere along the fault, but there are a lot of populations that live right on this active fault. And so it has been a big source of concern. Um, another thing though is that you might notice up in here there's a whole bunch of mountain ranges that kind of trend north and south. So this is a view looking uh, west. So these are north-south trending mountain ranges. So these faults are all active too. They're all producing earthquakes and they can be pretty devastating earthquakes too. In fact, there was one on this fault just a few years ago that was a seven point something. I don't remember the exact number and it was pretty damaging. So it's important to understand what faults are active, um, but to do that you really need to understand why they formed in the first place. So why these ones are here is the topic of conversation for today. So these are called normal faults. These, these are markers that typically denote a normal fault and that means the crust is being pulled apart. So here the crust is being stretched that way and stretched this way and everything between it's just getting pulled apart. So that's the thing that's really weird here. There shouldn't be that because really you would think all this material would just be smashed up. But in fact, it's actually getting pulled apart right here. Whereas down here, it's getting thrust upwards. So we'll be talking about why that is. Um, this is a map to give you some idea of what the rock units are between all of these fault systems. This is a very oversimplified geologic map of the whole Himalayan mountain range. And so what you see from, if you go from the south, molasses, this is basically just the sediments that are coming off of the Himalayan range. And then you have the main boundary thrust, which basically joins into the main frontal thrust. So that's our active thrust fault currently. And then north of that, this blue unit is called the Lesser Himalayan Sequence. All of these rocks across this whole mountain range, they're all metamorphosed sedimentary rocks. So they're sedimentary rocks that have been buried to a point where they got heated up and they recrystallized. Then they were brought back to the surface along these thrust faults. North of that, you cross, the, you cross the main central thrust and go into this purple unit, which is called the Greater Himalayan Sequence. This is an important rock unit because this is the one that actually makes up the high peaks of the Himalayas. It's mostly granite and high-grade metamorphic rocks. It used to be sedimentary rocks. They got buried so deep that they actually started melting. And then the main central thrust brought them back up to the surface where they're now exposed on famous peaks like Mount Everest. Mount Everest is mostly made of the Greater Himalayan Sequence. In fact, for reference, Mount Everest is right there. And right uh, past that boundary, you get to this green unit that's called the Tethian Sedimentary Sequence. These are all sedimentary rocks, oceanic sedimentary rocks that were deposited on the ocean between India and Asia before they collided and then they got, they, when they collided all of these got thrust up on here um, as this sequence of sedimentary rocks. So these actually used to be in the ocean between these two tectonic plates. How high is that? Mount Everest? <coughs> the green part. Uh, the you mean elevation wise? No. So the high, the, the sedimentary part gets into the Tibetan Plateau which has an average elevation of 5,000 meters which is really really high. <laughs> so basically, this is really low. You get up to Everest, which is the highest peak, and then it goes down a little bit, but then it stays at a really high elevation through the entire Tibetan Plateau. So the crustal structure, this is a line showing a cross-section. So from this point to this point, this diagram shows you what those rocks are actually doing with depth. So this is going to be the Indian continent that's kind of some of it's been subducted down, that's some of the oceanic crust that got subducted. Here there's a little bit of the continental crust that's being subducted. Um, but what's happening is that as that's being brought down, and this is pushing in this direction, all of these thrust faults formed. So this, is, this right here is the main frontal thrust, main boundary thrust. They sold down into this. This is the active one. Here's the main central thrust, the South Tibetan detachment system that are no longer active. But those two faults combined brought all of this greater Himalayan sequence up to the surface, which is why we can actually now see them on the face of Mount Everest. The red unit represents granites. So these rocks have been almost completely melted. Not all of them, but a lot of them were melted when they were down here really, really deep. So they get brought to the surface and then you can see those granites exposed. 
So right here would be about Mount, where Mount Everest is, then this would be the Tibetan Plateau, so still pretty high elevation. Um, what we're going to talk about though are these faults here. These are just a few of them. These are those normal faults that I've been talking about. So these faults are basically, these thrust faults are basically making this crust shorten, but then these normal faults are pulling it apart. So to show you some of the geology, this right here is Mount Everest. This is called Nupse, which is the peak right next to Mount Everest. It's only a few feet shorter than Everest, so it still is a pretty high peak. And what's interesting, I don't know if you can see it, right up here, see the color is a little bit different than it is right here. And it's a little bit different right here if you look through the snow. This right here is actually the South Tibetan Detachment, right on the very top of Mount Everest. So that means up above it are those oceanic sedimentary rocks that used to be on the ocean floor between these two continental plates. So now they're at the highest peak, at the very top of the highest peak in the world, which is very spectacular. So that just goes to show how much these faults have impacted this, the formation of the Himalayas. Um, all of this right here, this is the greater Himalayan sequence. So these are sedimentary rocks that were previously deposited and then they got metamorphosed when these plates collided. This is a little bit lighter. I know it's kind of hard to see because of all the snow, but this is all made of granite. So these rocks of the greater Himalayan sequence are high-grade metamorphic rocks, but a lot of them have been melted, so they recrystallized as a granite. So this shows what that actually looks like. OK, so back to extension. So that was all the background on the Himalayan geology. Now I want to talk to you about what I actually have been working on. So these are, all of these colored lines represent the active faults in the Himalayas. So you see the main central thrust and the South Tib Tibetan detachment are not on here because they're not active anymore. But the main frontal thrust is, and all of these other ones are. So there's a huge network of faults here. So they're color coded based on what kind of fault they are. So these blue ones are called strike slip faults. They're left lateral strike slip faults. So basically you have rocks sliding past each other. But in the left lateral, this block is sliding left, rel or sorry, left relative to the other block. Um, these green ones are right lateral. So basically that means all of, this, all of this little section right here in the Tibetan Plateau, see they're bound on the top by the blue and bound on the bottom by the green. That basically works to make this whole thing move that direction towards the east. So there's a lot of strike slip faults. There's the thrust faults. So these are where rocks are getting thrust up over another one. And then these red ones are called normal faults. So these are the ones that are actually being pulled apart. So there's a whole bunch of them. They all kind of go in the same direction. They're kind of, you see they're kind of radiating in their orientation. But really they're mostly north-south trending. And so the idea is, what's happened is that as India is moving north, this is called the Tarim Basin, which the Tarim Basin and India are both really solid chunks of continental crust. So as India is m moving northward, all of this stuff is basically getting smashed up between India and the Tarim Basin, because the Tarim Basin doesn't actually want, it, it's too rigid to deform. So eventually this will meet this and all this stuff will be gone, but you can only move stuff up so much. So that's why these normal faults form, because they can't go up enough to accommodate all that. So they have to basically, you have to ha pull this crust apart and move it out to the east and west to get rid of some of that material to accommodate this collision. So that's the idea for why these normal faults are there. But when they formed, how active they are, in other words, how much displacement has happened on them, what kind of history they've encountered, we really are just starting to understand. And so. I worked on the Amadrime, I worked on the faults that border the Amadrime Massif, which is right next door to Everest. And then most of my work was actually on the Leopargal Dome. So I was trying to figure out when these faults formed, how much have they moved, and what happened to the rocks that were exhumed because of those faults. And so that's what I'll be talking to you about today. I'm going to focus on Leopargal because the bulk of my research was on the Leopargal. So it's located right here. So this is a zoom in. So just so you can keep the reference, this is where Leopargal is located. This is what the geology looks like right in the Leopargal area. So here's the Leopargal dome. The peak is right here, the peak I showed you in my very first slide. These red lines are faults that are still active. These are normal faults, so you basically have a block going up and a block going down. They're still active. There's actually, there was a big earthquake on this little southern part of this fault in the 70s. 
And there was evidence there, there's a, a village that they basically rebuilt it because it was all collapsed when that earthquake happened. So it is, um, it is seismically active and it is a problem. So that made me feel better about trying to figure out the history of these faults. Um, to the south are the older faults, the South Tibetan Detachment and the main central thrust. Um, further to the south is the main frontal thrust. These are, these are the one, this is the one that's still active. And then to the north is the Karakoram Fault. This is one of those strike slip faults. So this block here is basically moving this direction relative to this block here. And so there's this really unique situation here where you have extension that's bound between the strike slip fault and this thrust fault. Um, so my goal was to, I wasn't able to get to most of this dome. I'll show you on the next map where the border is, but this is all Tibet. This is India, and the border kind of goes right like that. And so the, I wasn't actually allowed to go to the Tibet side, so I had to focus on the India side. So I actually only got to look at a very small part of this dome. But just doing that, I was able to get a lot of information. What I wanted to do was find out when this fault formed, how much it's moved, and the history of the rocks that are inside of the dome. So before I go into the really nerdy geology stuff, I wanted just to show you some fun slides about the stuff I got to see while I was there, because it was very neat. Um, I got to go there twice, and it was just an experience that was amazing, so I wanted to show you some pictures. So the Leopargal Dome, you can see it right here. You can see the shape of it just in the topography. So it's really high. It still has a really high elevation. Um, the faults bound each side of it. So what I need to do was to get from Delhi to there. So Delhi's about right here, and I had to drive up. I, didn't, I wasn't allowed to drive, but I had to get driven up there. So there's two ways that we went, and it was quite an adventure. So um, you could either go, so Delhi would be down here, and then you drive up. It's about a two-day drive to get from there to Shimla, and then another day to get to Rikong Pio, and then another day to get up here to the Dome. That was one way. Um, another way I went, um, when I came back, the first field season I went around this way, just because I wanted to see it, and it was really neat. Um, and that also, my second field season, that's the way I went in there too. So these are, it's challenging either way because these roads are really, they're not very well developed. This elevation is ridiculous, so they're scary roads to begin with. <laughs> um, so I'm going to show you some pictures. Um, but really, I think what most of my pictures I'm going to show you are coming from Shimla up through Manali, over Rotang lo, ro, Law just means pass. So this I had to go over the Rotang Pass, then over the Kunzun Pass. Rotang Pass is 13,000 feet in elevation. Kunzun Law is 15,000 feet in elevation. And so it was no easy feat really getting over those passes, although there's a road and a lot of people do it, but it, it had its challenges. And then it went down through here over to the dome. So getting there, here's just a few of the problems. This is what the road typically looks like. Um, it's only like the two tires of the car barely fit on the road. So it's scary. <laughs> this, you can't see the drop off as much because it's hidden, but see this is the ridge that comes down. Then it drops down probably another couple hundred feet down into the river. So there was like a thousand foot drop all the time. It was really, I got used to it, but the first few days I just was like, oh, I just, I would look, like I would look in that, like I would look towards the rock wall and not the other side of the car because I just didn't want to know what was over there. Um, but it was still really neat. I mean, you see the views are spectacular. I got to see some really neat things. Um, because the roads are this way, other than just me being scared out of my mind, the other challenge was just driving on them. Uh, it's hard to find a vehicle that can handle that kind of road. So we had a lot of problems like this one, and that right there is actually Paul trying to fix it, <laughs> which he succeeded in. <laughs> um, I don't really understand what happened exactly, but the car wouldn't go anymore. So, <laughs> so um, anyway, so we had to fix it, and then landslides were another huge problem. As you can see, you can see this kind of topography, you just have a lot of landslides. And so whichever route you want to get up to the dome is completely dependent on which landslides have been happening recently, and you don't always know. Um, but for example, this last time I went there, I was stuck um, in Tabo because I couldn't go through the passes because there were landslides. I was just stuck there for like a week because of the landslides. You have to wait for them to move them out. And they happen like daily. There's always a landslide, and you have to wait for them to move it around. So this was a little one that we had to deal with in 2011. 
This wasn't so bad, but we were stuck there for about three hours while they were brushing these huge boulders off of the road. But um, flat tires were another problem. I think overall in my two different field seasons, we had like six different flat tire situations. So good thing we had lots of spares. But it, so it, it was a challenge to get there, but it was worth it because I got to see some really cool things. This was the coolest. This was a complete coincidence, which is why it was so cool. We were driving through these little villages, and we saw this sign. I was like, no, really? And so we stayed an extra day because the Dalai Lama was coming through and giving, uh, he was giving a talk to the local um, Buddhists. So we stayed, so I got to see his talk, which is very, very spectacular. Although they're not anticipating um, English speakers to be there, so it wasn't translated, so I had no idea what he was saying. but. <laughs> It was still this thing that you could just get a lot out of it, even if you don't know the words that he's saying. So, um, but that was one of those coincidental things that made this all worth it. Aside from the geology, obviously that was cool too. So once I actually got to the field area, um, my goal was to actually see what the rocks were. I had to map where they, what kind of rocks there were. I had to map where the faults were. And what that meant was walking around a lot and trying to, like everywhere I'd go, I'd see, oh, well, this is this kind of rock, I'd have to write it down, or I'd see a fault and I'd have to follow it along and just basically make a map of it. Um, so this is me. This is actually, I don't know if you noticed, this is actually extremely posed. I, I mean, I really do take rock samples, but my advisor wanted a picture when I wasn't taking a rock sample, so that's me posing to take a rock sample. But this is what you do. You walk around, you map out what rocks there are, and then I had to take samples back with me so I could look at them in the microscope and try and answer some of the questions that I had. Um, these are some of the views. So this is the Leopardo Peak that I showed in the very first introductory slide. So um, this is actually looking to the Tibet side. Um, I was, this little ridge right here is the northernmost extent to which I was allowed to go. But this is looking in, actually looking into Tibet. So just kind of gives you an idea for the kind of topography that you have to deal with when you're doing geology here. And so obviously I couldn't go to most places. I had to infer what the, like I can't go up here. I'm not a mountaineer. So I had to f just kind of infer what was up there. But you know, there are a lot of the valleys you can go up. It's steep, but you can go up and you just try and see what the rocks are and map them. Um, this is a unique situation. Most of the time field work is really cool, but there are some hazards. You know, you have rocks falling. Um, these, though, are monkeys <laughs> that were throwing rocks at me, <laughs> like big rocks, like that big. And it was scary because this, right off of this picture, was like a drop off into that river, like a thousand foot drop off. So the monkeys, I hadn't, couldn't see them, and I went walking up here, and I was about here taking a sample here, and then my advisor was like, monkeys! And I looked up, I was like, oh gosh, and I went running down, but it's scary to run down because you don't want to <laughs> fall off that cliff. But they were throwing these rocks down here and they caused this big old rock slide that went right on down into the river. Luckily we all got out of the way, but I just, that was the first time I realized that maybe monkeys were not very nice. <laughs> but anyway, some of the weird things I had to deal with in the field, but it was still worth it. <laughs> so um, another thing I got to do was to interact with some of the local people. This is a family, this is uh, Tupton Negi. He actually works with the professor at the University of Delhi, who was one of my collaborators. And so he knew somebody, Tupton, who lived in one of the villages just right outside of my field area. And so he arranged for us to spend a few days with them and their family, so we'd have some place to stay. So this is Tupton and his family. Um, you can see their hats. These are called um, the Canari hats. The people in this area, they're, they're c called Canari people, and this is their traditional outfit. Um, the women often wear these vests and the dresses, but they still wear their canary hats. So we got to stay with them in their house, which is really, really spectacular. They made us some of their food, which is unfortunate because it was so good and I can't replicate it. Um, but also, um, while we were here, um, we stayed with them in their house for one day, but then there was another week that um, they weren't going to be there and we needed a place to stay, so we actually camped out in this big flat area in their village. And this was neat because this is a village, so the, this is the Leopardo Range. This is the road that goes along it. Um, there's a little bridge, if you go down, it goes over to this village, but then you have to hike to the village. There's not a road that goes to it. So there are tourists that go up through here, but they don't go to this town. This town is called Chuling. Tourists don't go there. And so 
um, this woman told us we were the first white people she had ever seen, which was, which was neat. And um, so when we got there, we obviously were kind of a novelty. And so we were, we were out here playing Frisbee, and all of these kids came running out to play Frisbee with us, and it was really neat to get. They, had, they didn't know what Frisbee was, and so we played it with them. This is what they look like. Um, they were really cute, and I have a video. They started singing for me, and I took a video because it was just the cutest thing. And I hope it works because I just wanted... Um, well, I know it won't work, so I'm just going to... I couldn't get it linked properly. But I want to show you the video because it's just really cute. Oops, sorry. Sorry, sorry. Where did it go? Now I'll turn up the volume. They were kind of shy at first because they didn't know what to think of us. But he was, they started dancing and singing. It was the cutest thing. This kid kept running up to look at them. He was looking at them on the video because he hadn't seen that before. <laughs> they were, they just kept running up to look at themselves on my screen because they just thought that was the coolest thing. But that's my field assistant list. Okay. That's probably enough. It was just too cute not to show you guys that, so I just thought I would. And they were, the way I met them initially was, so you saw that tent that was there, that was my tent. We were sleeping there. And I woke up in the morning and they were all like under there staring at me. I woke up, I was like, no, I must stay. And they just started giggling because I was talking to them. Um, so it, it was just fun to get to be there. Um, so to some of the geology, my goal was, it was lucky I, get to, I got to see all these cool things, but my goal was actually to map the geology here. So what I actually produced from walking around this whole area was a geologic map. And so all of these colors represent the different kinds of rock units. And so um, this purple unit is called a schist, which is a metamorphic rock. These kind of reddish orange colors are granites. So these have been intruded by granites. And all of these dark bold, uh, bold lines are the faults that I mapped out. And then over here in the green are the sedimentary rocks that used to be on the ocean basin. And so um, I made this map, and then I collected samples so I can answer some of my questions. These are cross sections showing what this map actually means. So from this point to this point, this is what the rocks are actually doing. So here, there's this unit, um, the purple, it's the schist. There's a brittle, normal fault brittle just means it's been broken rather than sheared out like silly putty. And then on this side is all, it's all of these granites and these metamorphic rocks. And this whole area here I called the Leopargal shear zone because it's all been ductally deformed. So all these rocks, they, when they were buried deep in the crust where they were still hot enough to basically act like silly putty, they were sheared out rather than breaking. Um, but then they got closer to the surface where they just broke instead. And so that's how that fault formed. And it's a similar thing down here. You have the Leopagal shear zone. Then you have these brittle faults that have formed over that ductal shear zone. So what my goal was to, with these rocks, first I needed to figure out this part. I needed to figure out the map and see what the rocks were doing. And then I needed to get constraints on when the fault formed, how much the fault moved, and um, also the history of how these rocks formed. So. Um, to do that, to look at how the rocks actually were deformed, I was able to do some of that in the field. You can see how some of these rocks are deformed. So this right here, this is schist, this is granite, and there's this fault cutting right down through it. So I can tell how they've been deformed. This is another example where I can see, it might be harder to see because of the lighting, but there's this little pot of rock here that's been basically cut by this fault. This is what this shear zone looks like. This is looking towards the east into the dome. So um, this, this would be towards the Tibet side. 
This uh, yellow unit is actually the shear zone. So these are all the rocks that were sheared when this, they, they were deep down in the crust. So this was our ductile fault. And then um, it's hard to see, but there's a lot of, see these little terraces here? Those are all there because of those brittle faults that offset these rocks. And so I was able to document, just looking at these, I could see these faults all dip towards the west. So that was how I was able to know that these, this fault actually had um, a west-directed extension. But I also needed to look at microstructures to be able to make sure that I could document that a little bit better. So the samples I brought back, I cut them into really small, tiny little sections that I could look at under a microscope to evaluate what the rocks were actually doing while they were being deformed. And I could see some, kind, some kinds of shear sense indicators. An example are shear bands, mica fish, and tails. These right here are called shear bands. And you can see they basically just like, they look like really microscopic faults. And so you can see this line right here, this block's been dropped down relative to that block. And then same here, they've been dropped down. So again, that's towards 300 degrees, which is west. So this is all top to the west in the field and also at the microstructure scale. These are feldspar that have been sheared out. So this, see this kind of weird shape that it has? That's because it was sort of ductile, kind of like a sort of melty M&M, and you're shearing it out. Um, so that's, that also can show me shear sense. All of these things, both in the field and at this scale, show me top to the west. So I was able to show exactly what direction that fault was moving. Um, the next thing I need to do was to figure out how hot these rocks were when they were being deformed. Because if I know that, then I know how deep in the crust they were. And then I can figure out how much they had to be exhumed to the surface. So I was able to figure out how much that fault had moved. So to do that, you have to look at, I used quartz. So at really low temperatures, these aren't really that low, but for quartz, it's kind of low. Um, what happens is your quartz crystal will, it wants to recrystallize as the heat is going up. But it starts what's called bulging recrystallization, which means it just starts recrystallizing right at the very edges of the crystal. So if I see that, I know that it's the temperature range that that quartz was at. Uh, Subgrain rotation is a little bit higher, and this is where you actually start recrystallizing the internal part of a quartz grain. Um, it looks like this, sort of. So like this right here all probably used to be one quartz grain, but you can see now it's a whole bunch of smaller quartz grains. So that gives me an idea of the temperature that this happened. Um, at higher temperatures, greater than 500 degrees Celsius, the boundaries just kind of go all crazy. They don't know what to do. So you see how these are just kind of really irregular, kind of lobate shapes. If you see that, you know that it's in this temperature range. Um, and there's also something called checkerboard extinction, which you can see in here, which means it just, you see these little blocks. And that only happens in quartz at greater than 650 degrees Celsius. So by looking at these, I was able to see how hot these rocks were. So when they were being deformed, I, was, I saw temperatures that indicated up to greater than 650 degrees. This is one example, um, through 280 degrees. So basically what that means is that these rocks were being deformed from depths of greater than 26 kilometers all the way through to 11 kilometers deep in the crust. So if I know that and then I know the orientation of that fault in the subsurface, I can figure out how much it's been displaced. And so I did that. So because I only documented this deformation from 26 to 11, that's what I calculated it based off of. And it's 35 kilometers of displacement, which is a lot. So this fault moved 35 kilometers, brought rocks from 26 kilometers depth all the way up to the surface. So it just kind of shows that this, these faults that we didn't really understand very well are pretty significant in terms of how the Himalaya is formed. The next thing I needed to do was try and document how these rocks had actually formed. And because they're metamorphic rocks, I was trying to get constraints on the metamorphism. So again, this is this view of the dome. These are what the rocks look like in there. So these are, um, this right here is called a schist. It's got garnet in it, storolite, kyanite. These are all minerals that form during metamorphism. And they all form at very specific pressures and temperatures when they're buried deep in the crust. And so what I wanted to do was try and figure out what those pressures and temperatures were. So one example of how I can do this, here's a close-up view of these rocks here. This right here, this red mineral is called storolite. I don't know if any of you have heard of storolite, but it's a really cool metamorphic mineral. 
It forms at relatively high pressures and temperatures, but then it's got this little white rim around it, which is called cordierite. That's a mineral that forms at lower pressures. So this is cool, because just looking at this, I can see these rocks were being metamorphosed at higher pressures, so deeper in the crust, and then they got brought up to the surface where they had the lower pressures, and the cordierite grew. But what I wanted to do is get an actual number on that. So to do that, you, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, but basically what you do is you figure out the composition of these minerals. So this is garnet. This is garnet looking with a back, it's called a backscattered electron image. It's basically an image that's made on, um, on an SEM, which is a scanning electron microscope. We have one here on campus, which is really great. And basically this is a view of the electrons that are being backscattered off of the surface of that sample. And so that gives you a little bit idea of the composition, but with this instrument you can also get an actual composition. So this is a map that shows the manganese content of that garnet. And so high manganese usually means higher temperature, or um, sorry, lower temperature. Um, low manganese usually means higher temperature. So you can see when the garnet first started growing, it was a little bit lower temperature, but then it grew through this point where the temperature was increasing as it was getting buried. And knowing these exact compositions, so this is, a, this, this is a diagram that shows the percentages of iron, magnesium, calcium, and manganese. Um, if I know those compositions, I can actually model out what pressure and temperature they formed at. Um, so without geeking out too much, I guess the point is that this composition, I was able to calculate that it, it formed at about 550 to 600 degrees Celsius and 7 kilobars, which is pretty similar to what I saw with the quartz. So I was able to confirm my quartz temperatures and also confirm my displacement estimate using these techniques. Um, also what I wanted to do though was to get, that was, a, that was a temperature for the peak metamorphism, so when it was the highest temperature. But remember there was this cordierite around it, and so that's lower pressure. And so I can actually document an actual temperature and pressure for when these rocks were being exhumed to the surface to try and confirm it, just how, what's the whole range in the depth of the crust where these rocks were being deformed. And uh, I basically did the same thing, but with the cordierite composition, and I was able to show that it was, um, the cordierite actually formed when these were 11 kilometers deep in the crust. So this formed while those quartz were actually deforming at those lower temperatures. So it all just goes to support the deformation, the displacement estimate that I calculated. And then the last thing that I was trying to do was figure out when all this happened. And so to do that, you can use a whole bunch of different techniques. I use something called radioactive decay. And basically how that works is if you have a mineral with a whole bunch of radioactive elements in it, through time those elements will break down to some other kind of element. If you know how fast that breakdown happens, then you can kind of calculate how long this rock has been around in order to get the amount of breakdown that you see in the rock. So to do that, I need to figure out the compositions of the minerals. Also, it's a little tricky because if I just get those ages for the minerals, it doesn't really tell me about like when garnet grew or when starlight grew. So I had to get a little creative for how to do that. So this is an aluminum map. This is a thin section. It's a really small piece of rock. Only like a, this is this is. I mean, that's only five millimeters. And this shows all of the aluminum compositions. So. Here's kyanite, it's got a lot more aluminum, so it's brighter colored. Starlight has some, so it's still bright. And then you've got like quartz and stuff that have none, so they're just really dark. <coughs> All of these spots are where I found a mineral called monazite, which has, um, has a lot of radioactive uranium in them, so you can actually use it to figure out how old this rock was. So what I needed to do, because I wanted to figure out when the starlight grew, because that was when they were deepest in the crust, when these rocks were deepest, I had to get ages for minerals inside of these grains, and then also ages for minerals outside. Because the idea was you had these monazites growing, then the starlight grew around it, and then it's isolated, it's not growing anymore, but then those outside of those grains are still growing. And so if I get ages on those, I can actually say when the starlight grew. And so these are some examples. Here I have an age, this is for this monazite here. Its youngest age is about 30 million years old. And this one here that's outside of it, its young age, age is 23. So that basically that means about 30 million years ago the starlight stopped growing and then can the, these minerals continued to grow until 23 million years ago. 
So what does that mean for the fault? Well, what that means for the fault is I need to figure out which of these ages actually grew while that fault was moving. So the idea is, um, in this diagram, this is looking at, this is the same image I showed you a few slides ago. This is kyanite and storolite. These are the ones that had the monazite, monazite grains inside of them. Um, these are the cordurite. What you see, the sterilite and the kyanite, they grow at higher pressures and temperatures. Um, then they're being deformed, so it's been pulled apart right here. It's been pulled apart, and you can see this has been sheared. So the fault happened after sterilite and kyanite grew. So my age for sterilite doesn't tell me anything about the fault. So what I need to do is figure out when these monazites were growing during deformation. So here's an example of one. This, this is just a drawing of one of the monazites that's located up in here. And it's got this, this is the same one in the last slide, this little rim is 23 million years old, but it's growing along this fabric of the rock, which is the faults fabric. And so what I interpreted is that this actually grew while this fault was moving, so 23 million years ago is one, that's the oldest age I have for when this fault moved. And here's another one, it's the same age, just to confirm that number. So what I know now is that this produced a lot of displacement, 34 kilometers of displacement, started 23 million years ago. And so what does that mean for this map here? So what that means is now we know when these faults first started forming. They're not all going to form at the same time, but this one here formed at 23 million years ago. It's produced a huge amount of displacement. So that's why you see it so strongly in the topography, because it is really a huge feature. So if this one's producing 23 kilometers of displacement, a lot of them we don't know, but since it's so big, we can assume that this, um, the fact that this crust is being pulled apart, that's happening at a very fast rate. So um, this is basically something that's going to cause a lot of seismic problems because these faults are really, really active and they're moving really fast. And so um, a lot of this area doesn't have a lot of population, but some air, like around Lhasa, there's a lot of population. So it is something to be considered. Um, also, um, what I'm doing now, so I was able to show a little bit about the Leopargal Dome, but this fault right here, the South Tibetan Detachment, is no longer active, but we don't really have a good idea on how much that fault has moved. And so what I'm trying to do now is figure out how much it's moved. And um, if I can, I want to figure out when it started moving. It's been well documented in other parts of the mountain range, but not, not here. So I have some samples from here. And Corey is one of my students that's been working on this problem with me this semester, and I have another one. And they're trying to figure out the deformation, deformation history, so they're trying to figure out how much this fault has moved. And so just to add to the understanding of this area. So with that, I hope I didn't blow your mind too much with the geology, but I want to say thank you for coming here. Um, and if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Yes? Jackie, what, what got you interested in this place? How did you zero in on the Leo Cardio Fault? Well, partly it was money, <laughs> because my advisor had a grant to go there specifically, so that's where I went. But the reason I wanted, when I did my master's degree, I was in Washington State, and I was going to either work on faults in California or faults in the Himalayas. I was like, well, they're both cool, but Himalayas. So then when I figured out I wanted to do a PhD. I found an advisor specifically that I could do more Himalayan research with, and this where he had funding was to send me to the Leo Pargal. Yes? What was the interest that ExxonMobil had in this research? Why would they have Not, In my research, nothing specifically, but they have grants for graduate students. Mm -hmm. So I just applied for one, and they gave it to me. Mm -hmm. I think it's part of their, I think they do it as a part of, um, they're trying to promote applicants. But any kind of geology, whether it's, I mean, it's obviously not oil related, they let you apply for the grants. Okay. Yep. Yes? It's not clear to me how you find out where a part of the fault line is moving toward the north and the other is moving east to west. So you're talking about how this is moving that direction, this is moving that direction? Right. So um, the only reason we can really know that's what's happening today is by GPS data. You can see in the GPS data, you can tell that these rocks are kind of being pulled apart, and this is actually moving northward. So the GPS data kind of tells us that's what it's doing today. That's only recently 
Recently, yes. So how do you know the rest of the history? So, you know, for the Leopargo situation, the way I knew was because I got that age of 23 million years ago. This is a fault that's been moving this east-west direction, that whole history. So it's just by looking at each of these individual faults and trying to get ages that we can see what happened in the past. So most of them we don't know. This one now we know Amadrime is about the same age, but most of these faults we don't know. So for example, you mentioned that it was Indian crust was moving at the rate of 4.5 centimeters a year. Right. Uh, how do you arrive at that figure? Well, that's, that's based off of this plate here, how fast it's moving north. So that, one, that one's derived from GPS. The past rates, we infer that from paleomagnetic data. So um, basically when there's rocks that have magnetic minerals in them, they will crystallize in the magnetic field direction. And you can kind of see how that changes through time. And so you can reconstruct where different parts of the crust were through time. If you can get an age of those rocks, you can figure out, you would know where it was and when it was there, and then you can calculate a rate for how fast it took to get to where it is now. So. I had visited some of this area 50 years ago. Oh, and yeah? if I knew they were moving, I could <laughs> leave some uh, <laughs> marks for you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Can your research help predict where earthquakes will be? So what I've done here is mostly going to give some insights on what the long-term history has been. So it doesn't necessarily tell you anything about what's going to be happen happening recently. But if you combine that with people that actually study the recent history, you can, I mean, at least you'll know that it's a really active fault and that maybe you should pay attention to it. And then people that study the active part of it can come and look at it and map fault scarps and figure out how often they move. Yes. Did you see on the, any other wildlife beside the monkeys? Donkeys. <laughs> up in the Himalayas, when we got really high, um, up in like my actual field area, there, it was too high for even the monkeys. So they were only kind of lower elevation. Um, but up in the villages where I was staying, there were a lot of donkeys. There were some cows. Um, that's pretty much all I saw. <laughs> Not a lot of, it's a, well, I will say I saw some what are called yak hybrids. Yaks grow, they don't grow, they do grow, but they live at very high elevation. This area, my field area was about 13, 14,000 feet elevation, which is still really high, but not as high as most of the Tibetan Plateau. So the yaks didn't really live there, but there were yak hybrids, which were a mix between yak and a cow. And they lived there, so I saw some of those. Yep. They're supposed to be snow leopards, but I never saw one. Well, yeah. <laughs> Darn it, huh? <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Right. All right. Um, I hope you'll join us for future brown bags, and uh, we look forward to seeing you again. And this was great. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, Anita. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's fun.